do is talk to you a little bit about uh, realizing the promise of gene therapy. Um, it'll be a little bit broader than perhaps uh, uh, for uh, just uh, neuromuscular diseases, but I think you'll see how it applies. So I think it's, it's I'd like to talk about is, you know, why is gene therapy important for rare diseases? People here may, maybe everyone understands that, but I think it's, it's worthwhile just stepping back uh, and thinking about that. Um, where we're going with this and how we're going to get there, because the how is really important. Um, and then what are we doing at FDA to try to help get there faster? Um, because my interaction with parents uh, and family members of people with rare diseases um, uh, have really helped me to realize that every day counts. So let's start with why is gene therapy important for rare diseases? And, and just, I hope you'll indulge me for a couple minutes. You know, when we think about potential rare disease therapeutics, this is not an exhaustive list, but we think about small molecules, protein therapeutics, antisense oligonucleotides, gene therapy, among other things, right? So let's just take them uh, one at a time here. You know, small molecules are things we're very used to at FDA. Uh, this is what uh, most drugs that we, uh, over, over uh, the past decades, have dealt with. Um, we understand how to make them. Uh, we understand how to study their adverse events, um, and they're usually pretty easy to take. Um, the disadvantages, though, are that these things are uh, things that one has to take on an ongoing basis, um, uh, but they're generally not curative, and there are certain diseases that you simply can't address with them. And protein therapeutics, rather than going through this whole slide, have many of the same characteristics. We do now know, I mean, these are newer products in many cases, but we do know how to uh, develop them now. We now have reasonable manufacturing processes worked out for many of them. Um, they have a higher probability of success than small molecules sometimes. Um, and people actually understand the business models for them. Um, but again, these are things that uh, you need uh, repeated administration for. Um, there's a high cost of production of these things on an ongoing basis. And again, they're not disease curative, and they can't address uh, any number of diseases uh, because of their nature. Antisense oligonucleotides, you know, these are a newer uh, product that we've seen come along, and they've been transformational in some cases, and in fact, even in uh, uh, Duchenne's. But, you know, uh, they have, uh, uh, we know how to make them. Uh, and they have a business model that one can use. And the reason why I mention business model is because at the end of the day, um, we have to be able to make therapies to be able to get them to people. And so if there's not a commercial way of making them, um, uh, that's a problem. So what are the disadvantages here? Again, need for repeated administration. The potential when you're developing them for unpredictable side effects. This is something we've seen. Um, we really have, again, this limited number of targets that can be addressed, um, and it's not a curative therapy. So, you know, gene therapy has a lot of unknowns, but um, its advantages, this concept that you might be able to administer one dose of something or a very few doses um, to address a disease. Um, when you're going into it, if you do your work properly, there is a reasonably high probability of success, possibility of success going into it um, based on what you develop uh, if you've done your animal work and all your other work correctly. Um, many different diseases can be addressed through gene therapy, including many that simply are not accessible to small molecular protein-based therapy. Think about structural proteins inside of cells. Um, and then, there's this wonderful piece, which is that, as we've seen kind of hinted at by the success in uh, uh, spinal muscular atrophy, this concept of long-term benefit um, that is uh, very significant. And then there are disadvantages, though. We have, to, we have to address this. There is the complexity and the cost of manufacture, which is uh, not something to sneeze at. Um, there is this concern that there might be irreversible side effects. Um, uh, in one case, you might not be able to give the gene therapy again because there's immunity uh, formed against it. Um, but more concerning sometimes is this concept of genotoxicity leading to cancer uh, at some point in the future. Um, 
there's this need for special expertise to administer these and to do it well, because um, uh, if one doesn't have that special expertise, um, uh, bad outcomes are possible. And it also presents the challenges of a new business model, because the pharmaceutical industry is used to an, uh, as a, essentially a pay-as-you-go. You get your prescription refilled every 30 days, and uh, that's a business model everyone understands. Um, on the other hand, when you give someone a therapy once and they don't need it again, uh, that's a different business model. And, and to make it even more complicated, if you've done your job well and your therapy is curative or near curative, once you've taken care of the glut of patients with disease now, then on a yearly basis, you actually have made your market smaller. But that, there are ways to address that, and we'll come to, uh, come to that. So right now, we, we, we sit at a very uh, a, a kind of exciting time in gene therapy. Um, you know, if, if this were several years ago, we would have only had chimeric antigen receptor T cells, modified T cells for uh, hematologic cancers, blood cancers, that would have been available. But over the past few years, now we have moved into having um, gene therapies that hit uh, spinal muscular atrophy that uh, get um, uh, rare disorders um, such as um, adrenal leukodystrophy, uh, beta thalassemia. Um, so we now, and you can see here in this list, that we've had last year we kind of had a, 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 a speeding up of the number of approvals. That's just because things are coming through the pipeline. And that pipeline is, is pretty robust. Um, uh, there are obviously a lot of genetically modified T cells for cancer coming through, um, but then a whole host of products for everything from uh, blood disorders, metabolic disorders, neuromuscular diseases. So I, I think we, we all in, in, in this room, if, if, you know, spinal muscular atrophy has proven to be, um, I think, what we look to as what happens when things go really well with gene therapy, um, which is given early in life. Uh, this is a gene therapy that takes a disease that leads to a child that uh, really can't lift their head um, and ultimately succumbs to a disease by a few years of age to one in which you have a child that can be running around at several years of age with no signs of disease. Now there's some uncertainty here. We don't know. Uh, long-term uh, benefit or effects, but this is still very promising here to be able to see this. It is really transformative. Um, and when you see this with gene therapy, this is, I think, what we can hold up as um, what things look like when things go really well. So if that's what looks really well, um, where are we going from here from where we stand right now? And I'll say to you right now that we don't have all the answers and all the correct answers at FDA. We're trying to get there, and we're going to make mistakes as we go, um, but our goal is to help get there. So where are we going? Well, we understand that rare disorders are incredibly important in the area of gene therapy. First of all, with the hundreds to thousands of them that are addressable by gene therapy currently, they actually make up diseases that affect millions upon millions of individuals in the United States alone. And if you take in aggregate the number of individuals affected globally, that becomes uh, multiplied by uh, uh, several fold. And the other issue um, is that as we think about where we're going in the world of gene therapy, increasingly we're starting to realize that CRISPR-Cas9, genome editing, actually fixing the genetic lesion is possible. The issue, though, is that many, even somewhat common diseases, are collections of, uh, of genomic uh, abnormalities. And to address those, we're going to have to treat a bunch of what amounts to rare diseases. Um, and so we need to get this right. And this really has shown us this transition uh, to individualized medicine. Personalized medicine is essentially off-the-rack medicine. You know, you, you figure out what size you are, you get the biomarker, and you pick the medicine off the, off the shelf. But uh, when we're talking about individualized medicine, we at FDA think about two different types. The one to the left is perhaps less interesting to some here, which is customized products, where we take something from a patient, 
perhaps it's their tumor or perhaps it's their cells. Um, and we then make a product with it to treat a given disease. So this indication is the same for a, the class of products, um, but each one is somewhat unique. But what we're dealing with in gene therapy is this issue of created products, where there are a lot of different diseases that are affecting perhaps just a handful of people to dozens to hundreds, where there will need to be a product created for those individuals. And this is essentially much like bespoke tailoring. We're going to have to figure out a way um, for doing something that we're not used to doing. Why? Because when you make small molecule drugs, these are things that are normally studied in large randomized controlled trials. But when you're making a, a gene therapy for 10, 20 people a year, um, the concept that you're going to do a randomized controlled trial um, uh, tends to break down pretty quick, uh, quickly. So how are we going to get to this place of being able to make these bespoke therapies? Well, there are some real challenges with individualized therapies. Um, there's, and, and I'm not going to be exhaustive in going through these. People are going to say, well, you forgot X, Y, and Z. I have. Um, but I just want to give you an example of non-clinical development, clinical development, product access, and manufacturing challenges. Um, uh, and the fact that I put manufacturing last probably puts, uh, helps uh, tell you something. Um, uh, uh, but let's start with non-clinical. So, you know, one of the problems we, we live with is the fact that although we do a lot of important work based on animal models, they can be less than ideal. First of all, it's hard to make them for certain diseases. Um, but even when we can make them, in some cases, the therapies that we're thinking of using um, make them irrelevant. Uh, because if you want to fix a gene defect uh, that is uh, uh, using a CRISPR-Cas9, a genome editing construct, um, using a human genome editing construct and giving it to a mouse or a dog, it doesn't help you much. I mean, it may say that there's not toxic uh, carry through in the, in the construct, but it's not going to tell you about whether there are what you really care about or off target effects. And so we have to think about how to deal with these things. Uh, people are figuring out how to make animal models uh, better, but they're also starting to uh, do things like making humanized mice, which help us in certain organs like the liver. Um, or we're able now to see this increasing uh, number of uh, people working with organoids, human organoids, where you actually can have uh, a, a C in various differentiated organ-like things, brains in the uh, brain-like things, um, liver-like things. Um, what the effect is? So there are ways around some of the non-clinical development problems. Clinical development, I already mentioned, it's a challenge when we have these very small populations, and so ever uh, increasingly documenting natural disease history and collection of baseline data is going to be important, but even more importantly is going to be our ability to do the science and understand the biomarkers that correlate with disease, um, intermediate endpoints that uh, correlate with outcomes, um, and to use things like Bayesian clinical trial designs where every patient that goes into the trial tells you something that gives you a different probability um, uh, when the next patient enters of whether the treatment is going to work or not and that at a certain point you can actually do a trial where you decide, uh, you declare success with the fewest number of patients. Product access, critical. Um, we don't deal directly at FDA with the cost of therapies. Unlike some other countries, we, we don't get into the cost of therapies. Nonetheless, we are very uh, much aware um, of the issue of product cost. Um, uh, because that actually limits uh, product availability. Um, and so uh, what we're seeing is uh, right now this time when public-private partnerships could potentially help enable pro product access for very small populations. But that's probably not a long-term solution. The real solution is probably getting reduced development and production costs that could actually facilitate a viable commercial uh, ecosystem, because that robust ecosystem will probably lead to um, uh, the production of products for people across a variety of different diseases. 
And a lot of that then gets to the fact that uh, what I wanted to spend a little bit more time talking about is manufacturing. Manufacturing is uh, something that is, tends to be very boring to talk about, uh, but when it comes to gene therapy, it is one of the most important things right now that we can think of. Why? Because right now, manufacturing, I would say, you know, if, if, if this were the stages of life, manufacturing, it's no longer in its infancy, um, but it's in its toddler age. Uh, and we need to, as quickly as possible, uh, get it to maturity. Um, and th that's really important because it will make a big difference for being able to study these therapies and make them available. Right now, the cost of just making a batch of gene therapy for a small clinical trial in 10 patients, if you have to give it systemically to individuals who are 10 to 20 kilograms, um, they can be about a quarter of a million dollars or more per dose um, easily. And that's not including technology transfer costs, other things. So this is a real challenge here. Um, uh, and so it, this is a place where we need to think about how we're going to get this better. The, the good news is gene therapies in this mid-range, for mid-range of people of hundreds of doses a, a, a year, very commercially viable. So that's a good thing. The problem, uh, the problems come when you try to go gene therapies for thousands and thousands of people. That's something for another day. That will require us getting either much better at making uh, viral vectors or moving to non-viral vectors. But what I want to focus in on is what do we do about gene therapies for very small numbers of people. Um, and that's where you need to make a couple of dozen doses per year. And you have to understand that this is more relevant than you might think, because for some rare disorders, one or two or three years down the line after you have a gene therapy, you're only going to need to make uh, a, a several doses a year because you will have treated a bolus of people, and it will take time for uh, individuals with uh, rare disease uh, to appear again. This, is, this isn't one of these nice things, that, a good way to explain prevalence and incidence. Um, uh, so what are we going to do to, to facilitate this? Well, <laughs> this is not a conference on chimeric antigen receptor T cells, but what has happened in that field is automation. And what you're looking at here is that it's not to advertise any manufacturer, it's just to show that there are closed manufacturing systems that have really made this much easier uh, and actually made it accessible to even academic um, institutions to produce products on site if they want to. Can we do the same thing, though, for gene therapies? Could we see this kind of automation? And there's no reason why we can't. I'm not trying to uh, bore anyone with the schematic diagram here, but it's just to show that people actually are working on this um, and trying to automate the process and this type of automation could be transformative because that could actually make it possible for companies instead of having to reinvent the wheel each time they go to put uh, a new gene therapy through to use a device that to manufacture that gene therapy that uses disposable components and by the way disposable components in a device well established business model for manufacturing we, so hopefully, probably, uh, the device of the future uh, will look, um, won't look exactly like this because it won't be a soda machine, but um, it will hopefully allow us to move forward um, gene therapy in these small batches and make this commercially viable. So what's FDA doing to help get uh, to the, this place faster? And I've said this already in this talk, and I'll say it again. We don't always get it right, but we want to do our best. Uh, and ultimately get it right. Um, so right now, in, in terms of gene therapy, um, this is a field that has grown incredibly. I've been at FDA for 11 years. Um, there were no approved gene therapies when I came. The office that was regulating this um, was one of the smaller offices um, in, in our center. Um, and now we're in a very different place. Um, with the growth in gene therapy, we now have literally um, thousands of applications to tend, actually. Right now, there are 2,500 active cell and gene therapy investigation and drug applications. What's attendant with that is the fact that because people submit 
amendments to those. It means we're getting over 10,000 amendments to get through um, uh, a year. And this is, this is a lot of work. Uh, and so we've been lucky enough to have Congress understand that and uh, the companies as we negotiated the recent user fee acts. And we now have uh, the ability to, to hire up significantly. We're hiring uh, uh, about 150 or so uh, new reviewers in this area and other uh, uh, specialists in the gene therapy area. Now that's a big, a big increase that's important for us. Um, um, if for those of you who are, uh, know anyone who's interested, you send them my way. Um, but what it, what it has done is it's taken an office that had, when you have 100 or 150 people, it's easy to manage them in, in, in one structure. Once you get to 500 people um, or close to it, we had to decide to do some reorganizing. So we've now reorganized um, our Office of Therapeutic Products, which was one office into what is called a super office. It's basically, the, it's the, the difference is it went from being an operating division to an operating company with its own divisions. And so there's now a cell, a cell therapy and a gene therapy, chemistry and manufacturing control branch, one each. Um, there's a separate uh, branch that handles plasma therapeutics. There's an office of clinical evaluation so that our reviewers can, we can hire more reviewers with a wider range of expertise. Um, uh, an office of pharmacology and toxicology and, uh, and essentially a, a project management office. Hopefully this will, uh, by having a matrix organization like this, this will allow us to more readily uh, review the large volume of submissions. But then that's just a piece of it. What else are we going to do? Well, we need to clearly advance manufacturing technologies for cell and gene therapy through research. And I'll tell you a little bit more about each of these as, as in the next couple minutes. Um, we also have to work to more clearly define the use of accelerated approval for gene therapy because for many rare diseases, we're just not going to get there in a timely manner if we keep using our, our current approach. Um, we will need to uh, think about whether we can solve some of the current commercial lesion um, that's hindering getting gene therapies that might be approved in one country to those in multiple countries. And it goes both ways. Some that are approved here could be beneficial in other countries, and some that are available in other countries could be beneficial to people here. And we need to start to think about how, for very rare diseases or uncommon diseases, we can do this better. And I'll also tell you a little bit about what we will try to leverage from uh, Operation Warp Speed towards rare, rare diseases. I did have the, uh, uh, essentially, the luck um, uh, uh, of, of being part of the team that was involved with the vaccine production um, uh, early on during the pandemic. And there was a lot of learning then, which is very relevant still. So in terms of, uh, in terms of how we're going to do manufacturing better, um, people may have heard about the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium. This is a, uh, a, an effort that's coming out of the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. Uh, which um, is essentially a nonprofit organization that is um, uh, working with a number of companies, uh, non-government organizations, um, and uh, various government uh, organizations to try to figure out how to improve the technology for adeno-associated virus um, uh, it itself in terms of use as a vector, how to manufacture it more consistently, and how to actually study rare diseases most efficiently. Um, with the idea, ultimately, of trying to put together the equivalent of a cookbook or playbook uh, for the development and manufacturing of bespoke therapeutics. Um, and we think that will be helpful um, because right now, one of the challenges is that uh, many times the, a small gene therapy is developed in an institution where a single provider has the majority of a given rare disease patient type in the country. And they might make that gene therapy a different way than others might, uh, uh, and that might, those others might be making it a different way from others. This diversity actually is not helpful um, because it actually increases costs when one goes to transfer manufacturing from an academic process to a commercial process. You can imagine that it would be easier if everyone was doing things in a similar manner in terms of uh, making their products early on, because then they could transfer uh, more easily 
uh, and hopefully less expensively to contract manufacturers. And then this other piece, which is something that we are positioned at FDA to do, which is to leverage the unique nature of gene therapy. Gene therapies are obviously drugs, but they're different than small molecule drugs, right? Small molecule drugs, they're generally each one is its own thing. It might have different substituents on it, but um, you don't generally reuse them uh, and reuse them. Whereas the truth is that gene therapy vectors can be reused. Now, there are limitations. You can't put any old insert into a vector. But the concept of reusing gene therapy vectors and then making use of the information you have, toxicology information, manufacturing information for those vectors, um, is potentially very powerful. This concept is that if you have some originator product, some original product that's well characterized, and then you decide, okay, we can put inserts within a certain size range that produce a certain type of protein into that. Um, can we shift from one insert to another and perhaps have eight related uh, gene therapies that are produced by the same manufacturing process for which one doesn't have to go through the submission process of all the manufacturing information and toxicology information. One just focuses on the differences caused by the insert. That could potentially streamline development timelines, reduce costs, and hopefully get more gene therapies through in a more timely manner. And this is the type of thing we have to be thinking about as we think about uh, not just uh, adeno-associated viral gene therapy as we now know it, but also as we move more into uh, genome editing. The other piece we have to do is start to leverage accelerated approval more. Now, accelerated approval, by some people's uh, uh, assessment, is not a good thing. They think that this is a, a shortcut. But I would put it to you that um, there are the right ways of using accelerated approval and perhaps the wrong ways of using accelerated approval. Certainly, I think the right way of using accelerated approval is when we leverage the science to the maximum um, and potentially address um, uh, diseases that we just will not get to in a timely manner any other way, diseases for which people are dying today, um, uh, where we can have a very good link between the science and what we think the outcomes will be. And so for diseases where we understand enzyme activity levels or structural protein levels, when they can be correlated with clinical endpoints, either in an animal model or in a human uh, uh, disease, we can hopefully advance here. This is a new place for us to be moving into. Um, and I think you'll see us, we're, you know, we're, we're getting our toes in the water here, but we have to. We have to because otherwise it's going to just take too many years to get through the large number uh, of rare diseases that need to be addressed. Uh, and if we fall and stumble, we'll pick ourselves up and do the right thing. We always are going to keep safety front and foremost, okay? But um, I, I think uh, the, the issue here is that um, we can't be so careful about our approvals um, uh, under accelerated approval that we prevent potentially life-saving therapies from getting to market in a timely manner. The other couple of issues here, um, I, I've mentioned to you this issue of sustainability of the gene therapy ecosystem. During the pandemic, as the economy took some downturn, there was some real fallout in the gene therapy area, which is that some gene therapies that were quite promising for very small populations fell out of development at companies. They ended up giving back to investigators at academic institutions, or some just got essentially shelved. Uh, and that's a shame. So how do we fix that? Well, we've talked about making manufacturing more efficient. But one of the other ways of making this more efficient um, and, and more commercially viable is to make it easier to have a gene therapy that's approved in one country globally available. Now, whether it's globally available in every country, that's probably too tall an order. But there are several countries in, in, in the world. We, the European Union, as a, as a, as a group of countries, um, Japan, Canada, others, that may be able to come together and find a way um, to uh, actually work together uh, on, uh, on these uh, 
products so that we could actually get towards having a patient population that might be 20 people in the United States, 40 people in the European Union, another 20 people in Japan. You could actually get to markets that are getting towards that uh, commercial viability if you could make the regulatory burden low enough so that the submissions could take place and it wasn't a new uncertainty each time a, uh, a, a manufacturer went into a new uh, location. And I would say to you that one of the reasons why this is so important is because from my perspective, these extremely expensive therapies currently are, though we have them in high income countries uh, moving along, for some diseases, these are the only hope for any quality of life or any survival in low and middle income countries where there's not supportive care like we have it here in a high income country like the United States. Uh, and so trying to move these forward and trying to make the, uh, help the regulatory environment move forward and reduce their costs is really critical towards global access. Don't have all the solutions here because it's clear that there, there is a deficit of dollars um, uh, or euros, but we need to work and think about this. And I think we do have the desire for global cooperation because we've come to this, other regulators have also kind of come to the same conclusion. Uh, and uh, if we could come to some convergence of regulatory approaches in high income countries, I, I dare say harmonization because harmonization is, is, is probably a, a high bar. Um, like the Inf International Conference on Harmonization, but its, it's uh, convergence may help. Um, and then whether we can get to a place where we can do collaborative reviews to make things easier, um, much in the same way as in the oncology field, um, uh, where they have something called Project Orbis at FDA, which is, at this point, I think it's about eight or so regulators that concurrently uh, review applications uh, so that ultimately these products are available um, uh, to more of the world's population all at once. And then what can we do to help move things forward uh, more quickly? Uh, and whether that goes to manufacturing or to clinical development um, or to other aspects of development. Well, in Operation Warp Speed, um, uh, which I got to see pretty close up, um, the things that really helped us um, were really just really boiled down to two things. One was manufacturing at risk. We'll leave that aside for now. But the other was reducing development time by having constant communication with those people developing the products. What happened was the time that we would have spent normally in delay because somebody had a question and we have a, uh, we have certain meeting types that have certain timelines associated with them normally at FDA, either 60 days or 75 days or perhaps 30 days in some cases. If you eliminated those, you, you can imagine if you had two or three 60 day delays, that's, you know, months. And um, it may not be such a big problem for large companies, although they'll tell you it's a problem for them as well. But if you're a small venture company, it's, it's catastrophic sometimes. So we think that by reducing this kind of time, or the hypothesis here that we'd like to test is that by doing something warp speed like for promising therapies for rare diseases, where we have kind of constant communication with those who are developing them, uh, we may be able to make a difference and speed those therapies. And even if we can only reduce the time from, uh, uh, from uh, they enter clinical trials to the time they get uh, approved by 25%, that translates into people potentially being alive um, or petite people with reduced suffering. So we will, uh, in the coming months, announce this in a Federal Register notice. We'll start small with a couple of programs working up to uh, hopefully about 10 by the end of the year. And then if th things go well, we'll evaluate this and then uh, continue, uh, because this is very labor intensive. Um, it led to uh, a, a lot of stress and it met when during the vaccine development, we had to prioritize and let go of some other things. So we'll probably have to staff up ultimately if we decide to move forward with this. but. I think we're going to, just like I've said, we have to be data driven with our accelerated approval. 
we'll be data-driven ourselves on whether this makes a difference um, as we move forward. So just to, to finish up, I think, you know, we are very committed to advancing the timely development and availability of gene therapies for all sorts of disorders. I think it's a new area for all of us. Um, it's one where um, we're learning as we go. I think we will, as I say, we will make mistakes um, as a field and as FDA, and we'll try to make sure that we make the least, uh, uh, the, uh, the least significant ones, um, uh, but we'll always try to get it right at the end. And I think ultimately, if we really remain focused on really helping to individualize product development, to helping use our existing pathways to their absolute maximum, leverage the science, leverage our technologies for manufacturing, uh, and working towards global regulatory uh, convergence will hopefully make a difference for rare disease patients, not just here in the United States, but globally. So I'll stop there, and I think I'll have a couple minutes for questions. <laughs>